Uh, Dr. James is Vice President of Mission and Associate Chief Medical Officer at Boston Medical Center. Um, she's a full professor of emergency medicine um, and director of the Violence Intervention Advocacy Program at Boston Medical Center. She's also a founding member of the National Network of Hospital-Based Violence Intervention Advocacy Programs and has had multiple accolades over the past 20 years that are TN, too numerous to count. <laughs> so um, without further ado, um, I would like to invite you up to, you. to speak. Good morning, everyone. Thank you for the honor to share this time with you this morning. I'm really grateful for the invitation. And I think I was trying to think about how um, I wanted to sort of like frame this. And um, I, I, I'll, I'll frame it like this. When I was, you know, a resident, I, I feel like I learned really, really early in the first year that um, <clears throat> I kind of felt like we were missing some things in terms of, you know, how we had been educated um, and how emergency medicine is one of those specialties where it's so rapid, the pace is so rapid, people are coming through so much and there are people waiting to come in and stuff. And what and we're, we're taught so much to like focus on disease, um, but not necessarily to question it when we see the same people presenting over and over again with the same problem, we do what we're supposed to do. And, you know, we're kind of taught, or at least the culture is like, well, if it doesn't work, they didn't do what they're supposed to do, and da 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 da. And so, um, or what we told them to do, and you know, we it, it just never seemed to work. So I, as a resident, started asking people, what would it take for this not to happen again? And I would kind of like start my intervention there, because they, at patients, they're like us. We were humans, you know. We're going to act based upon what matters to us. And so, um, uh, and I'm going to try to talk to you about uh, an organizational transformation that we had, and I would say it's only a couple years, like in 2021. And I just want to sort of like share this with you. Um, these are things I'm basically kind of like going to cover, um, you know, from sort of like top to bottom. And then I'm going to start right here though. So this is our hospital. Um, you know, we are the largest safety net hospital in New England. Um, we 80, more than 80% of our patients are government insured with, uh, the majority being, uh, Medicaid. Um, we cover 40% of the Medicaid lives in the Commonwealth of Massachusetts. And, um, we are also in the top 20 of, uh, NIH recipients in the country. And, you know, our, our primary teaching hospital is uh, Boston University School of Medicine. One in seven black births occur in our hospital, one in 13 Hispanic births, and one in 100 white births. So when you see these things here, you already sort of like probably get a snapshot of the population, you know, we treat. And you probably also have in your mind all of the other kinds of things that are associated with that population. You know, they're probably going to have lower education attainment, you know, where they reside, there are going to be higher rates of um, violence, community violence and homicides, and also that they're going to have a lower um, standard of uh, a lower, lower health outcomes. All these things will come to your mind, but we don't often um, wonder why. The other thing we don't often wonder is, is it possible for that to be changed? But, you know, as well-meaning people, we look at people like this and we think, well, you know, you know, folks like this need charity. They need stuff. They have a lot of gaps that we have, we have to fill, but we don't necessarily interrogate this whole thing. And so at our hospital, over many decades, we have created lots and lots of programs to sort of address the gaps that our patients have. And many of them have even been disseminated, you know, around the country. For example, MLP Boston is the medical legal partnership because our patients have a lot of legal issues around housing and things like that, that uh, need to be addressed that we can partner with them on. It's called MLP Boston because it's also now in other states and other cities. So we have to call it that. The VIA program is the violence intervention program. This program was one of the seven founding members of the National 
violence program that's now called the Health Alliance for Violence um, uh, Intervention, and it has, um, you know, a, a national conference every year and, and everything. And then street cred, which has also um, been disseminated and called something else as a type of coalition, but it was created by two pediatrics residents who basically created something that when uh, parents bring their kids to pediatrics clinic, they also can get their taxes done for free. And the intentionality of that was to address, you know, enable them to take advantage of the earned income tax credit. This is only about seven years old and they've brought back millions of um, dollars for people. And so just, and we do all these things, but despite doing all those things, these data don't change. This stuff like never changes. And let's be honest. So are you are you surprised by it? If you're surprised by it, you've probably been living on Mars, you know, for a while. No, seriously, because you know, this is exactly what we expect. But again, you know, nobody like really um interrogates that or or wonders how did that happen? Because it's certainly not like organic, you know. So back in 2017, 2018. We started asking ourselves, what is the role of a safety net hospital? You know, we fall under this classification of America's essential hospitals. Like, what is the role? Is it charity exclusively in perpetuity, which changes nobody's life? It does not alter one's life course trajectory. It does not enable you to get out of the line of need. Is it, in fact, charity or is it equity? I mean, we actually asked this question back in. 2017 and 2018. And we kind of started, you know, thinking about how do we answer that question? And one of the things, what the, one of the ways to answer was this was to try to figure out and learn about how it all started, right? Is there anybody in this room who's not heard of redlining? That's great, because I was just going to say, just Google it. <laughs> <laughs> That's really easy, right? And so you know that, you know, this happened all over the country. But, you know, honestly, I feel like it was one of the greatest um, and most successful strategies of economic exclusion that has ever happened in the country. And it's it's it was so good that it's self-perpetuating. And that's why these maps match the COVID maps all these many, you know, decades later. And so the thing about it, though, and that's just a, a sample of where it was, you know, these red lines actually become blurred because we start to expect what we see. We say this is the natural order of things. It's, in, you know, it's, it's, it's inevitable that these data will be like this. And so in 2021, um, when the country was turning upside down and we were having this, this reckoning, um, our CEO and COO, um, decided that, you know, and everybody, all the corporations and everybody, you know, companies, everybody, institutions were coming out with commitments to equity statements. They decided, our CEO and CEO said, we're not going to do that. We're not going to do that. We are going to pause and not pause to do nothing, but pause to take a look inside our own house. And so what we did was this big data analysis across the entire enterprise and um, looking for health disparities and not to just identify them because, I mean, no, no criticism whatsoever, but many people create entire careers on health disparities, but not necessarily with an intentionality to close the gaps. And so um, we had these big forums on Zoom in the hospital and we came up, first of all, with some principles of engagement because we, we, you know, the things we found internally were really hard to see and they were compounded by, you know, we hired an agency to interview all of these patients and uh, we would have these Zooms and there would be slides up there with quotations from the patients. And sometimes you could feel the silence on the Zoom because it was stunning for many folks to like, see these things that patients were saying. And so I won't read all of this, but one of the things that I was really happy about, and the COO was really strong, and it was him that actually, you know, said this, you know, he was like, there are no sacred um, 
programs or anything. Just because something like those programs I listed, if there's something in here that doesn't make sense anymore, it can go. It doesn't have to stay just because it's been here for 15, 20 years. It can go. I mean, those were the things that, you know, uh, I really appreciated. And and also that we were there was going to be no blaming or shaming. We were going to be going through this process together and we were going to, um, you know, support each other. And also, um, I love the fact that he said, you know, we will not shy away from the difficult questions and, and conversations. And instead, we will engage in our discomfort. That takes a lot of courage. It takes a lot of courage to look at yourself and then a lot of courage to stand in whatever it is that, that you find. And so this was the strategy. By the way, he is a strategist. He's now also the CEO because I'm going to say thankfully, but not thankfully and unfortunately, our other CEO got tagged to be the Secretary of Health and Human Services for our new state administration. So everybody was happy about that because she, you know, reflects all these values. Um, and so he's now, the COO is now the CEO and he organized 80 leaders across the hospital and um, divided, us up, divided us up into six work groups. Now there are seven things up here, but there are six work groups that cover all these various different things right here. And I mean, um, you, you know, a, each group, had to come up with uh, three or four, maybe five um, disparities that, you know, that we found representing these different groups that we were, that, that each work group was going to work on closing over the next 12 to 24 months. And everything you proposed had to be vetted. It could not, you could not propose something that looked like something we'd done before and call it equity. That just could not fly. He just was not going to have that. And there was a really, really high level of accountability. And so you know, you might know some of these people. Some of them aren't even uh, at VMC anymore. But that's what the different you know work groups looks like. Looks like they all had executive leadership. And again, it was really, really tedious. You know, the word that keeps coming to my mind, but I don't let, I don't say it. Onerous, <laughs> you know. I but it was like really. There was a lot of frequency and how, as you can see, how often we met, the kinds of things we had to think about, the work we had to get done on these um, on these calls every week. And also we had to report out, you know, every month to the equity oversight group. We still do it. We absolutely still do it. So these work groups now only report out every, every quarter, but, um, what we report, we still report to the oversight group on a regular basis, and the work groups still meet on a on a regular basis. And so these are just some graphics to show, sort of um, or images to sort of reflect the kinds of things that are covered in each of those uh, six work groups. And I want you to notice um, the dollar signs there because you know the one thing is just like we started this conversation. I don't care what you look at it. People don't have housing. They don't have food, whatever they don't have. None of it's free. So it's economics. It's all economics at the root. And so a lot of what we've done is to address that. And I'll share uh, some, uh, some of the ways in which we've done that um, so far. These are, this is, again, I showed you those images so you wouldn't have to read through all this stuff here because, um, you know, that's what this all is. That's what those um, images represent. And then we had to figure out, like, so how do we operationalize this stuff we come up with? How do we systemically operationalize this? They hired a um, facilitator and uh, a consultant and put us in a room for two days. There must have been like 10 of us in the room for two days, 10 or 15. And uh, we had to come up with it. And we came up with the Health Equity Accelerator. The name Accelerator was intentional. It has a lot to do with the, the the process that we were going to use about closing gaps and the CEO the COO wanted us to not take forever to do these things not like do research and more research and more research but to do things rapidly and at the exact same same time it's like do what you can do immediately and then um, around that you can study you know going forward and add context to it by various different studies but they wanted us to do what we could do. Uh, immediately. 
And um, as you can see, you know, this is the intentionality of the health equity accelerator. These clinical areas down here are the ones where we saw the highest rates of um, inequity or uh, disparities. And we had to figure out, and, and, and all of these areas, obviously, at up top, we were, we're working on all these things at the same time. But we also had to figure out a way how to interpret the data. Because if you think about it, when we look at data, we're trying to figure out a problem no matter what we find. You know, we generally like go in a room and, you know, just sort of picking the data apart and try to figure out, oh, how this is how we should address this. And we interpret it based upon like what we know. But the one thing we learned from COVID was, or the pandemic was that um, we don't know. I mean, you know, how you, how can you know? You, you, we don't have lived experience. You know, I guess what I'm trying to say is you have to involve the subjects of the data. They can tell you what it means. And so, um, and, and now we need everything with that. And my God, it's so efficient. You get to the, to the answer so quickly, but we also partner with the subjects of the data to find solutions and implement, implement stuff. I mean, it's so fast, it's so easy, it has helped us tremendously. And I'll give you some examples of, 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 of that as well. And what was happening during the pandemic is we had two problems. We had an access problem and we had a hesitancy problem. And we started hosting these Zooms. We had just hired a vice president of community engagement and external affairs, her name's uh, Katrina Cherry. And you know she knows a lot of people and stuff. And so she just started reaching out to community leaders faith-based people, organizational people, social organization people, all kinds of people, and, and other people in the community to, to get to the Zooms. We stacked the deck by using infectious disease doctors of color. And we had two, uh, two intentions for those Zooms. One was to um, answer the questions that people had about, around not trusting the vaccine. The second thing we did was uh, to have the people in the community help us to answer the question because although everybody knew who was doing worse in the city, which populations, which neighborhoods, when the vaccination sites came online, that's not where they were placed. Now, you know, that's like um, public health 101, but that's not where, where they were placed. But it was a good uh, example to seize the opportunity to say, Everybody's wondering why populations don't trust healthcare. If you experience that kind of thing your whole life, that's why. People talk about Tuskegee and all that stuff. There's no, it's like what happened last week, yesterday, and your whole life. And so, um, but what we did was to our strategy department, operations people, they were out in the community walking through various different buildings with community members to identify where sites should be, what should they look like, feel like, set up the whole operations together and everything. And we were able to vaccinate uh, the, that, the, those communities at four and a half times the rate the state was able to do it. And the state actually was a great partner because they gave us all the vaccine we could want. So that turned out really, really well. And so um, this is the leadership of the, um, you know, the Health Equity Accelerator. These people on the right side are all the equity oversight group that we report out to um, every month. And in the beginning, you know, we, we, in terms of the clinical areas, we said, you know, we're going to, you know, work on these areas. And I also must say, the way we use community members now, we, I mean, as partners, we don't just go to them when we have to do a community health needs assessment, you know, and come back in three years or whatever. They are now a part of how we operate everything. We work with them constantly every month. I mean, you know, they're, we call them an equity partnership network. It's like a pie and each sort of slice works on various different things they want to work on. In fact, they helped us to decide in which order we would do these, uh, these pillars. Uh, one at a time. And so um, uh, they are very much, you know, um, integrated into how we operate and do things. We wanted to enable all of these clinical areas with these things down here. And um, the next slide I'm going to show you is um, the data on the slide is um, behind. It's not current. 
And um, I just want to acknowledge that because I was trying to change it and I felt like there was some kind of like hopes or something on me because I couldn't change them. I'm, 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 I'm serious. It's like I was trying this morning when I was upstairs. I was like, it's not working. Anyway, this is just an example of the accountability that was uh, placed on us, you know, and they all, this all represents the six work groups and uh, the COO, who's now the CEO was saying just last month, he's like, okay, you know, we, you know, if there's no red up there now, you know, we're, we're, we're not working hard enough. So anyway, so this is an example of some of the data, but I can tell you, for example, um, the community patients is maybe about right maybe a couple thousand off, but for community events, for example, we've had 20. We even have hosted for the last three years, hosted but presented um, um, presentations on Martha's Vineyard every, I, I guess for the, this past summer was the third summer. And we actually, as I'm standing here now, they're meeting about 2024 right now. Um, and um, for the one that's under SDOA that says, 700 community jobs at BMC. So we had this um, uh, J.P. Morgan Chase grant, and it was about community vitalization and economic mobility. And we, the the what we intended to do was to identify one of the things we intended to do was identify seven zip codes we serve, and uh, create a pipeline for 52 jobs, living wage jobs inside our hospital. Well, we uh, we ultimately did more than a thousand in one year. And there are other things inside the hospital uh, that focus on that as well. And I'll talk about that in, in a little bit as well. Um, far more, uh, 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 a few more grants um, than those right there. So we have um, these uh, sort of seed grants, we call them internally. And it took about, in the beginning, when people were applying for these grants, after we formed the accelerator, they weren't getting funded. And it's because they were presenting the same kind of proposals they had been presenting forever. They were not designed to close gaps. And so they didn't get funded. And after about three rounds of these, then they started getting it. Um, we also have actually five fellows now. The first two are about to graduate and they, we are going to um, you know, employ them as independent internal um, you know, equity entities within the organization if they if they decide to you know to stay, because they also get you know a degree from um, the school of public health at the exact same time. One's a nurse, one's a doctor. Um, yeah. Okay. And uh, we've done a whole bunch of hiring, you know, to fill all these things as um, as they come up. And I mean, we knew we needed some of this stuff, other things we didn't necessarily know we needed, but you know, as we needed them, we just started growing and, and, and hiring people. And also the research uh, department was the, the, the last piece of the whole thing put together. Our uh, chief scientific officer is uh, a pediatrician. She now is the vice president as well. And then we hired a director actually from New York, Liza uh, Fuentes, who was on the last slide. And, you know, it's basically to help people who are in, you know, who, who want to be researchers um, to, uh, you know, gain the type of uh, skills and things that they are, they're going to need. And also to help them develop as, you know, academic uh, research professionals. And um, this is just an example of, you know, one of the, the, uh, the, the uh, awards or the grants that we, that we give out. We just sort of like posted this. Um, a week or two ago, just as an example, I just put it here as an example for someone who was interested in uh, applying for one of those grants and what it might look like and what's required. And um, right after we did the accelerator, you know, we had an opportunity to publish this in New England Journal of Medicine Catalyst. And honestly, you know, the main and and this was before many of these outcomes that I'm about to share with you. But you know, people, I would say the main. Um, theme coming out of this was if you think you have no disparities, look again. <laughs> and so everybody knows this, but I'm showing this and a few slides right after it as an example of what is the model that we use to close gaps. And our OBGYN doctors actually helped us with the model because this is the model that we use for everything now. And so 
in our hospital, we saw this disparity in severe maternal morbidity and mostly um, postpartum hemorrhage. And what the OBGYN doctors decided to do is they said, we will interrogate the data back to the root cause. And the first thing that they found was that this disparity was associated with preeclampsia. And uh, as you guys know, you know, particularly in the late stages of pregnancy, you know, the, the treatment for, for this is to deliver the baby. And in the data, they noticed that the sooner the decision to go to um, C-section was made, the less likely this outcome happened. And then they looked at the data again and saw that um, the doctors were taking twice as long to make that decision in black patients, black and brown patients. And so to the COO's um, point, the, the first thing they did was to do something quickly was to standardize the decision-making protocol. Now, you guys know that's really hard to do because doctors don't like being told what to do, when, how, right? But they did it. They did it. And honestly, that in and of itself closed the gap. Just that. But we also didn't leave it at that. We also had a qualitative component to it where they were interviewing all of the doctors, all of the nurses, the midwives, even the techs and things in the, uh, in the OR, all these people, they were interviewing them and the patients to get add context to the variability. And what they saw, and a lot of it is you know, reflected in this graph over here as things that were influential um, uh, the intervention, you know, or what a person's decision was to do after they saw um, that a person had an elevated blood pressure. And, you know, you know, one of the things that you can see is like biases, you know, there uh, in the center of, uh, of the whole thing. And this was incredibly helpful, but then we didn't just stop there. We then asked the patients, talk to the patients and other people as well, but mainly the patients like what, again, what do you think could have influenced this in a different way? What do you, did you need? What would have helped you? How could you know? How could this have been better for you? And one of the things they said they wanted was uh, a chatbot. Whoa! They wish they had a lot of questions. I mean, they wish they had uh, someone to answer these qu answer the questions they had. So you know, long story short, we created a chatbot with the questions in them that they wanted. They also said they wish they had more information about preeclampsia and that type of thing. So we co-created videos with them. I wish I had one to show you here because they're incredible. They're really great. And, uh, you know, you can tell that they are made for the people, you know, who, you know, could most benefit and needed the information to help make decisions. And by the way, you know, there was a lot of, and not only was there bias, but mistrust on both sides. Patients don't trust the doctors, doctors don't trust, you know, the patients. And this is um, the gap closure in terms of, you know, time to decision to go, uh, we call it decision to incision time. And it's incredible, just by just standardizing it, this is what happened. And this translates, you know, into, into you know, lives and things, you know, what happens to people in these situations. And then they recently um, published on that. And then, um, <clears throat> this is the slide I meant to show before, I realized it was out of order. Um, so the first thing we did was, um, you know, not the first thing, but one of the earliest things we did was to start doing remote blood pressure monitoring for, for pregnant women. And, um, you know, it, it helps people don't have to like come to the hospital when something's happening or somebody can notice something that the patient might not feel or whatever. And, uh, you know, that's been incredible for us. And I was telling you about uh, the chat pot in the videos. Um, Feel like the, oh doulas, I'll tell you about them in a in a in a second. Um, so that's what's happened. In addition to closing, you know, the gap on uh, this uh, decision to incision, um, our um, readmission rate for preeclampsia is this in just one year. In just one year, and it just shows again like what happens when you have intentionality to do something and not think like some people think you can't change the stuff and say you can't boil the ocean. That's crazy. You know, these things were created. You just do the alternative. That's all, you know? I mean, what do you have to lose other than lives and, and quality of life for, for patients? 
And so I wanted to show this because, you know, we've had people call them doulas. We call them birth sisters. We've had them since 1996 or 97. And, um, you know, we, uh, fought a lot or advocated a lot for uh, these positions being um, reimbursed by Medicaid in our state. And so uh, now we're going to quadruple this workforce at our hospital and many more people will have them because this was a randomized control uh, study that they did some years ago just to see the difference in outcomes for people who had them or did not. And as you can see, I mean, it makes a difference when you have them. And so so that's mostly all the clinical things, but I just want to talk to you about, like, it's an ecosystem. There is the clinical stuff, but also, and particularly as we think about the root cause of economics, you know, the, I mean, patients just basically can't prioritize health when they're prioritizing survival. It's just simple. And, you know, they're making rational decisions. They really are. And so we belong to something called the Healthcare Anchor Network. And its goal is to build more inclusive, sustainable local economies through hospitals being intentional about how they make decisions in hiring, investment, and procurement. So in terms of hiring, I was telling you about the pipeline um, work we did, but also internally, Human Resources has a program called Pathways. And um, what happens is they take people who are at um, in entry-level jobs, they do a professional development curriculum that's really intense for six months and also with you know, uh, mentoring. And uh, at the end of six months, people can apply for jobs as managers. And we have uh, a, a, another program very similar where people can apply to be directors. Like this lady stopped me in the cafeteria a couple of weeks ago and said, oh, I've been meaning to email you. I'm now uh, director of operations for some department. This other lady who was in environmental services told me, oh, yeah, now I'm a manager. I'm the manager of the breast center, you know. And so all those things enable people to, you know, not only have more income, but also to build generational wealth and build assets. Because it's about assets. It's not so much about income. It's about assets. Like, what do you have to hold you in place in in when there's a, a challenge, like a pandemic or something? Can you afford to, you know, work? Uh, and not work and still be okay for yourself and your family. So we do um, a lot of things like the street credit program I told you. They do a lot of, of um, financial literacy and education and stuff like that. We are right now beginning to um, work on an institutional sy sy systematic um, operationalization of, um, of um, economic mobility. And then we also, for the patients, we also have uh, a screener that we use where everybody who comes in the hospital in ambulatory care areas gets screened uh, for things they don't have, food, housing, whatever. And I remember when we started that screener back in 2017, I remember having to advocate to put education and employment on there. And the only way I did it was one day in the meeting, I was like, I was asking people, how'd you get your job? How'd you get your job? How'd you get your job? Like, you know, when people come into the door, with a problem, like if they've lost a job or whatever, if it's our own families, we put them on a path to self-sustainability. Why do we send other people to like charity, vouchers? I mean, why? What makes our minds like split like that? This kind of thing is also a better business model because when you enable people to be self-sufficient, financially secure, financially stable, they are contributing to the economy. They are consumers like the rest of us. They are contributing to the economy and they help the GDP because the carve outs that you make um, in the GDP actually to for charity, for vouchers and all that stuff, that stuff like it dwindles. I mean, you, do, you don't have to like spend that money for that. So it's a much, much, much better um, um, business model in general. We also invest, you know, we, in our state, when a hospital builds onto its facility, you build a new tower or you buy a new piece of expensive equipment like an MRI, the state says you have to get 5% of the total cost to the community. And um, in 2017, we did a campus redesign. We had six and a half million dollars to spend. Now, I mean, compared to the exact same time, uh, Children's Hospital had, uh, we call it determination of need, they had 53.4 million that they had to spend. Right now, today, Mass General Brigham 
has 69 million to spend. And we have a new one now too, 4.3 million. But it's about what you do with it. And I think when we did that back in 2017, the state liked it. You know, and now all of us, actually all the hospitals that used to do their own um, community health needs assessment individually since 2019, we have done it together. And so, um, so we're like, we go to each other's community advisory boards and talk about what we've done and stuff so they understand the options of how they can spend that money. And so we invest in housing and this type of thing. We invest in small businesses, all different you know, kinds of things. And we also procure with intentionality. We, uh, we actually have an internal health anchor network uh, committee that at where the procurement um, department actually every month they send me um, data on uh, women, minorities, um, people with disabilities, like how many vendors are we using that fall under that? How much of the $2 billion we spend in procurement every year, what percentage of that, you know, goes to other people? And it has just risen and risen and risen ever since we started this thing uh, during the, during the um, pandemic. And I'll show you some examples. So this here, you, you definitely should Google Nubian Markets in Boston. Okay, so one of the things we invested in was Nubian Markets. And it was interesting because we had invested in something called Healthy Neighborhood Equity Fund. And um, the Healthy Neighborhood Equity Fund was, uh, you know, funding a, the development of a housing development in, in, uh, in Roxbury in Boston. And they had retail on the bottom. And so they wanted, the people in the community said they wanted a grocery store and this type of thing. And uh, so we we invested in um, a guy who lives in Washington, D.C., and he had markets there. And the pandemic happened and he goes, oh, you know, um, we can't we can't travel to Boston. It's not safe. We'll find you a couple of local operators. The store had not opened or anything yet. It was just a big box with, a, you know, with some, you know, freezers in it and things like that. And uh, he introduced us to these two black guys who are both really like um, experienced in this. They have their own businesses. One of them was featured in Bon Appetit last summer. He's been a chef in residence on Martha's Vineyard. But they, those guys are like, nope, no interest in being operators. We, we want to own the business and we want to own the physical space because they know what wealth building is about and how that happens. So it took us 16 months of banging on the table with the other people in the capital stack, but eventually they caved, thankfully, and um, those guys uh, are now owners and operators, I mean, owners of the building and the, and the space, and what, uh, I wish you could see it, oh my God, it's just unreal, but it's used by the community, it's used by the legislature, it's used by all kinds of people, because it is actually a halal market, but it also and and it also has a cafe, a grocery store with a pipeline of vendors that uh, are committed to what they're attempting to do, and also a community space. So lots of you know things happen um, in that place, and the food is delicious. You know they cater. I mean all kinds of things. We also invest in City Fresh Foods. They are a company that provides um, prepared meals for kids and for elderly people, they've been in business over 20 years, but their rent had gone up 150%. And they were not going to be able to continue as a company. And so we talked to Children's Hospital, we talked to the city of Boston, and the three of us each um, uh, contributed to the capital stack. And not only that, the city wound up giving them um, a $17 million contract for Boston Public Schools. And they have their their new space and everything, which is directly uh, or cat corner to where their building is now. And by the way, the goal of doing these capital stack things is to not just give people capital, but to give them cheap capital. You know, for example, you know, banks will give them loans, but it'll be associated with high interest rates and untenable repayment terms. We give them no interest loans. And we give them what we call patient re, uh, repayment terms. So they have plenty of time, you know, to pay back. And the last example is procurement. 
right here is a, a mental health center we just built in Brockton, where which is a diverse community of mostly, you know, uh, black and and Caribbean and you know Latino patients, and um, we hired a developer who is up who is also um, BIPOC, and we hired from the community so that we can contribute to the economy of the community at the exact same time. It's also carbon net zero, the whole thing. And we've done a lot in that space as well. In fact, we just, um, we have a lot of um, solar panels on on a, a one of our buildings. And so we just did this thing where we take the credits from, the, from, from that and donate them to our patients. And we're starting out with 80 patients who are in the complex care management program. And, um, you know, and, and this is also, we, we're not causing damage to that environment there as well. And we also, again, you can't do it by yourself. We have lots of partners that we, you know, we partner with. You see these life sciences and mass bio people here because, you know, uh, that industry has changed in terms of what it takes to be employed there. As my former CEO used to say, um, it's not like, um, PhDs and bottle washers anymore. You know, they are, they have a, a middle, you know, group of people um, who can start these jobs with just high school diplomas starting out at seventy, eighty thousand dollars a year, and in two years can uh, make like twice that and more. And so we are partnering with them because they want the community, but they don't know how to reach them. And that is what our partnership um, with them has been. And uh, before our CEO, our former CEO left, and she left in March, she wrote this article, and um, basically focusing on you know the five lessons learned over the past couple of years of doing this work and this transformation, and you know she's talking about all these things here and what it takes to you know to to uh, address that, and. and um, you know, for example, timing is everything. One of the things we found in our looking at data is that we take much longer to diagnose things in people of color, and particularly stuff like prediabetes, for example, um, and, and in engaging subpopulations. When you think about uh, a disease like uh, prostate cancer, you know, it's something that's really thought that, you know, you know, it's easy to treat these days. You don't have to put, you know, a ton of... Um, attention to it, but it depends upon what population you're treating, because in our for, for black men it's still way up there. Um and so um in terms of diabetes, and I'm almost done, I promise I think that's the last couple slides. Uh you know we just um sort of did a wrap up uh annual presentation to the um advisory oversight group and just telling them some of the data and for example, if you think about diabetes, using the same model of um, intentionality, interrogating data, involving the subjects of the data in the implementation of so for solutions. And uh, we had like 1,200 patients engaged in uh, diabetes monitoring. And uh, this is what happened in six months. So, I mean, actively six months, like this, this year, uh, 400 patients. Uh, have reduced their hemoglobin A1Cs. And then a subset of them, we also added mental health onto it. And for them, 90% of that cohort has reduced their hemoglobin A1C. And they also, their PHQ9, which is the, the you know, the depression um, score. And um, just other stuff, you know, that you can, can see under there. One of them I already told you about the decrease in um, postpartum uh, preeclampsia readmissions, but it just goes once again to show you what you can do with intentionality. And that's what I mean about how efficient it is and just how quickly stuff um, will actually happen. And um, and so, you know, we also, you know, sort of put together what our core themes are, you know, as we go forward and sort of prepare for um, uh, 2024. And I don't want to read this entire thing, but part of this is what we've been doing and uh, a little bit of it is, you know, what we aspire to do. And all of this ended uh, last month with our very first health equity summit. And honestly, I'll tell you, uh, there's Uche Blackstone up there. He's one of the panelists. 
these were uh this is uh Khalil um Gibran and somebody from McKinsey. This is our uh one of our chiefs in the city for economic mobility and inclusion. This is somebody from TIA. This woman is from Compass Working Capital, which is an organization that um uh addresses the cliff effect. You know, like when you know when you when people live or or work in um or People live in public housing, and you know you're first of all you're only allowed. I don't know why people think this is like a solution or helpful to people for housing to give them public housing because like you can only earn like two thousand dollars a month. If you exceed that by one penny, you lose the housing, you lose any food um, uh, uh, subsidies, and you you lose your childcare subsidies. And even the person is working, like people turn down raises and jobs, you know. And so it's a trap. But anyway, she works with something uh, with a HUD program called Family Self-Sufficiency that enables people to earn more money. Um, and that overage goes into escrow for home ownership, education, or whatever else it is you want to do. And um, I mean, I'm not suggesting that people have subsidies and make as much money as they want. I'm saying at least give people a runway I mean, they, our parents do that, you know, they don't kick you out generally as soon as you get out of school, um, unless they're going to subsidize you, you know, but, it, it, you know, give people an opportunity to be able to be independent. But this thing was a real great success. And um, the only thing, the, the thing that I found, you know, that, that, that was most uh, encouraging to me is there were executive leaders from other healthcare systems from around the country who uh, emailed me afterwards and stuff and said, you know, we go to a lot of equity summits, but this one was distinctly different in terms of how you like called out things at root causes. Because these guys on this panel, that's the economic mobility panel, they were talking about being sued and all these various different It was incredible. Um, but they said, but the, the, the thing that I appreciated most and you know will help us going forward was they said, we learned so much. We learn so much, and that means that we can all continue to collaborate and you know scale all this stuff all over the country. Quite frankly, and I think this is it. Yeah, this is just stuff. Uh, we we have a new marketing person. She's been with us just over a year. She's got this kind of stuff going on inside train stations and banners on the streets and and everything. So anyway, that's it. And thank you guys so much for listening. Any questions? Yes, sir. Hi, I just want to flip your the question. So one of the things you said talk about is you massively increased the amount of positions and offices you guys had in terms of directors and whatnot. Where did the money come from? I knew you were gonna ask me that. <laughs> you know, that's the worst question in the world for us. Because most people build based on budget. We don't. We just build and you know, we figure it'll come. You know, we have the development department working for us. I mean, because now in development, we actually have, they have a portfolio of funders who only want to fund economic mobility. Imagine that. I mean, because our whole goal is to change this whole notion of what a safety net hospital is, is what it should be. Safety net hospitals were created by the same people who created Redlining. So you know that they didn't have much, like, fourth, you, you know. So, um uh, but but that's the truth. I, I'm telling you the truth. We don't sit down with a budget. We even do a lot of grants that way. At least the people who I work with um, in these uh, things like investment and stuff like that, like we will submit something for a grant, but in our minds, even when we submit it, the ink is still wet. Because as we learn, as we go along and we see stuff, once the, the money arrives, I mean, we change stuff. But you have to have people who are allowing you to have that flexibility, funders, you know, who allow you to have that level of flexibility. So, no, did we go out and on a capital campaign and stuff before we started this? No, we didn't. We didn't. But our development department has been great um, in, you know, seeking um, funders for us all the time. I know it's hard for you to believe, but look, I gave you the comparison about how much money we had versus children's versus MGB, and those guys have portfolios to do that kind of stuff. We don't have that. 
we, we it's not possible for us to have that. So um, we depend on the development department and other people who, you know, are into fundraising, um, getting grants and, and, and wonderful um, funders, even like foundations, family foundations, who are um, people who are, I don't want to say progressive in their thought, it's like that, but I don't want to like set some kind of uh, stage. They just are thoughtful people who this stuff makes sense to them. Yes, ma'am. Yeah, it's a good question. You, you, I should know it. I know some of it, but not all of it. Um, uh, it's funny. I only work one shift a month these days in the ER because I'm doing all this other stuff. But um, and, I, and it's volunteer shifts because I just love it. You know, I still love it so much, and it's taught me everything I know, quite frankly. Um, but um, I was talking to the chair of our emergency department a couple of weeks ago, two or three weeks ago, and I was telling him when I started this job in in uh as vp of mission i thought that everything we're doing right now i thought it was going to be so easy because it was going to happen in the ed because the ed is nice and contained it's a laboratory for you know this kind of stuff didn't happen just didn't happen right and so um what 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 they're about to start in the ed is um going to start screening in the ed with the thrive uh screener they are about to start a fellowship you know, in the ED. Um, but the ED has done so much stuff like the violence program comes out of that. And that was a proof of concept where you change these kids from who people think they are, like gangsters and all this stuff, to entrepreneurs. Um, they have, you know, degrees. They uh, work in the trades. I mean, they own buildings, all kinds of stuff, you know. And so, um, yeah. Yeah. Um, they're not doing anything exactly like the stuff I described, but I I, I feel like uh, we'll get there. We'll definitely get there. That that was my biggest surprise, quite frankly. I thought it would all start right there. Oh, I'm so sorry, Priscilla. Hi. My hand has not been up for very long, so no apologies needed. Oh, okay, thank you. I'm so sorry. <laughs> thank you so much for. Uh this lecture, it was really incredible and really interesting. Um, I work in community engagement for the Office of Healthcare Equity here for UW Medicine. And I took this position sort of mid pandemic and this position was created mid pandemic. So as we're sort of coming out of this, going more into in-person, what would be your best advice um, to connect more with the community to start making those really strong partnerships? And yeah. my second question is, are these slides going to be shared? Yeah, they will be. Um, first of all, my first thought is to connect you to Petrina because, <laughs> you know, it's her. I remember uh, when I was first given the job of mission at some point midway, the CEO asked me, would you like to change your title to community, whatever, VP of community? I'm like, nope, because I've never seen that job done uh, the way it could be done. And I don't know how to do that. <laughs> so, um, Fair. Um, and I'm glad I did it. I'm glad I stayed in my lane. And uh, but she, Petrina has actually been the best example you one could ever imagine so i would like to connect you to her if you don't mind um because she could answer that question and i can say she started with you know just like getting people on zooms like starting with relationships and if and if you feel like you uh might not know everybody in the community ask people who like work in this hospital who represent the community i i guarantee you they'll they'll take you to the right place Ask the patients, ask, you know, it's just easy. Just start with them. They already know. They already know. And they're happy to help you. The, the thought, the fact that, uh, or the notion that somebody wants to find this out and wants to engage, they'll be more than happy to help you. Wonderful. Thank you so much. Sure. And if you like email me, and I don't know why I'm looking up there, like you're there, but like. I'm going to drop my email in the chat. I'm sorry. I put my email address in the chat if that might be easier. Uh, or maybe not. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> Thank, Thank you. you. Sure. Anyone else? Yes. I'm curious about the 
curious if you have any future plans to standardize this approach for other imp implementation in other cities and other sites and what advice you would have for some of the like structural components that you were able to implement like the Medicaid negotiations or even what I was really struck by was the um, renewables credit that you were able to give back to patients in need those kind of things in my mind just seem like they would there would be so many barriers and challenges to implementing those like what I mean Medicaid for one I mean that, but especially like coverage in other areas Washington might not be the best example but the first thing that comes to mind for me is like the southern U.S. Um, and like the lack of coverage for the majority of people and how like you would recommend sort of engaging with that sort of um, you know like structural challenge yeah so um, you know what we hope to do is to collaborate with people and demonstrate things and hopefully that will influence the people who are able to maneuver and work you know in those environments one of the greatest challenges with many states is they did not do medicaid expansion so there's so much that they cannot do um because you know they don't have the resources but they are doing stuff because we met with harris health system uh from houston uh they don't have medicaid expansion and they have a bunch of stuff that they're you know uh starting right now and a little and other stuff that they've done we just met with them this week and so a site visit at our place with that so you know it is possible in terms of like the this uh the um energy stuff we did with it didn't take anybody to do it except us and um the uh eversource which is like you know the grid people or whatever that's all the state had nothing to do with it. medicaid had nothing to do with it, really just the two of us just did it uh, a doctor uh, Dr. Anna Goldstein reached out to me one day and said, hey, I have this idea. And I just connected her with the senior vice president for facilities. You know, and that was it. They just like had this big media thing last last week because this is just a done deal. And that was less than a year ago. Thank you. Sure. Welcome. Anyone else? Yes, sir. No, no. Well, one's from Scotland, <laughs> and um, and the other one, but he, but he, so, and and the other one, uh, she's from Boston. You know, the CEO who is now Secretary of Health and Human Services for us for for Massachusetts. But yeah, so she, so she came in um, 2010, I think it was, and it was at a time when Massachusetts had just done healthcare reform, essentially giving everybody in Massachusetts health insurance. And so, uh, and, th and that's another point to make, like a lot of people say it's access. Well, everybody in Massachusetts has health insurance. And only over 90% of people in Massachusetts have health insurance. And, uh, and the ones who don't, I don't, either they're uninsured, they might be coming from other, you know, places in the world or whatever. And, um, but those data didn't change, right? So just to show you how you know you have to do something different. But so when Massachusetts did that, it meant that it took away all this free care money we were getting to take care of people. And so it was a financial strain for us. And um, so the other, the CEO who was there at the time left, and then the new one came on. And then when she was trying to restructure things and set things up, um, she hired who, who, uh, the COO to come on as a consultant from McKinsey and, uh, you know, in very short order, he became the COO, uh, he was working with us and, uh, or, you know, on our staff. And so long story short, no, now he's from Scotland. Um, he was working for McKinsey and, um, he went to HB at Harvard business school and then, uh, and he, and he came and started working with us. And so when she left, uh, the one who went to be Secretary of Health and Human Services, when she left in March, um, she he had been there for about 10, 11, 12 years. He had so he'd already been there. And they're just, they're just, you know, they're they're just uh I will say it's organizational culture, you know, it's totally organizational culture. Because even when we're sitting at tables with our colleagues from other hospitals. 
no matter what the people at the table might have in mind, ultimately whether or not they're able to implement it depends upon those who sit up there, you know, so organizational culture. And I, I would say we've been incredibly just fortunate to have leadership that, you know, um, for them, I mean, they kind of like never say no. Well, every time somebody asks me what made me stay there so long and never leave, and I'm like, because they never say no. <laughs> you know, so. And sometimes, you know, there's some things that you do, particularly when we first started doing this investment stuff. Um, you know, they trusted us with the six and a half million to do stuff. And, you know, sometimes you have to go ahead and do it before you tell them what you're doing. And just so they don't get, you know, alarmed by it. And then when they see what it does, it, you know, they, you know, it's all about emotional intelligence and stuff like that, the way you move around. Yes. Something you said in doing this type of research that's not just kind of turning a lens on health disparities, but rather showing how they can be disrupted and true equity can be achieved. Do you feel like in in BMC and in the community that that's helped to mitigate like physician burnout or helps people think of our careers as more sustainable to be doing like meaningful research that's actually shifting the sense of sustainable instead of really just stagnant. Right. That's a good question. If I use myself as an example, I was never burned out, but I was over it. You know, I was just over the, the cycling this. It's like you might as well like work a, like a hamburger joint. Honestly, because that's what you're doing, flipping burgers. You know, you're feeding people and they come back, they're hungry again. They, you know, it, it, it wasn't really, you know, changing things. And the thing about it is, in my mind, the only thing preventing us from changing is just mindset, you know, just mindset and just like accepting the status quo and never challenging it. And I'm just lucky, I, I would say, and fortunate, you know, to have been in a place where, you know, we were allowed to 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 do it. Yes. Um, but I'm struck by how much um, what a what a great leadership role you have with the group and the system. And uh, can, you, can you talk about sort of how the skills, your skills as an emergency doc, have really allowed you to kind of move into this position and how those skills translate into how those skills have been able to ask you. Yeah, it's an interesting question. I always wanted to be an ER doctor, even before I went to medical school. You know, I just always knew it was going to be that. It's not like I wanted to be a doctor as a kid or anything, but once I decided I wanted to be a doctor, I always thought about this. And um, I think it's because, like, first of all, I like people a lot. I like people. And um, and I like science and I like listening to people. And so what happened to me, I think when I opened up this morning, I was talking about I learned early on. Um, I think the first thing that happened was um, I had a Haitian patient who we had diagnosed um, with HIV. And he looked at me without batting an eye and he was like, I don't have it. And if I have it, you gave it to me. And I was like, whoa, I was an intern. I was like, you know what? I'm going to be, I'm going, to, I'm not going to do well at this job because I, this guy is saying this and I couldn't understand why he was saying it, but I knew immediately that it wasn't him. I assumed it was me. I was like, I'm, I don't understand something. And so I figured the only way I could figure it out was to go to Haiti. And, and, and as soon as I uh, was able to do like um, an elective, I went to Haiti and I stayed there for a month in La Tibonite in the, uh, in a place called De Chapelle. And, um, I learned it right then and there. And and what and, and it was my own ignorance. Didn't know it was the poorest country in the Western Hemisphere. Didn't know about this, the um, the revolt where it was the first free republic, you know, that the slaves did um, in 81 when HIV was first identified and they created this list of high risk groups, you know, um, hemophiliacs, uh, gay males, um, uh, IV drug users, Haitians and all that. And the Haitians were like, no, <laughs> no, we, dis we, we don't accept it. And also because of that revolt, the world sort of never forgave them for it. And including the United States, France, all these other people. And so what I took away from all of that is people interpret what they see and hear based on life experience. And so when I started 
seeing patients in the ER again, like over and over, same people. I just started engaging in with them in a different way to try to figure out what was at the root of this. And like, if you had your choice, like, what would you do? You know, what would it take for you not to, you know, be in this space? And I also would listen to what was going on around me. Like I could hear, like it would always bother me. I go in to see a patient and um, I'm asking the questions like, you know, the, 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 you know, the little placard they give you, the card that tells you how to talk to people. And, um, you know, and, uh, and I'd be asking them all these questions and, you know, how this, and when did this start? You know, what makes it better? What makes it worse? Da, da, da. How long is it? Da, da, da. Um, ever had surgery, all these other things. And then um, I go through the physical exam and I see a surgical scar. And I ask him, well, I thought you never had surgery. Um, and well, what, what did they do? And, and this was like when we had paper charts, not even like Epic and stuff, right? And they don't even know. And I was like, something's not right here. You know, something's not right here. And so, um, and then, you know, um, or a person who maybe had surgery last week, I still have the image of the room I was in that day when that person told me that. And I called the surgical resident to come down and the patient didn't know anything. And, uh, and I hear the, 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 the resident and they're talking to the patient. And well, yeah, you know, we did this, we did it, we did it, we did it, we did it. Like, patients don't know. I mean, like, it's not engagement. And so, um, I don't know, I guess a combination of just like, uh, you know, being able to, to identify and, 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 and cite all the ways in which we could have done better and how it would have made a difference in somebody's life, you know, and, uh, and understanding and that type thing and decision-making all sorts of stuff. And so um, I think maybe it's maybe just that. And, you know, and my folks said when I was a kid, I never, you know, woke up too early, was always shaking the crib, like come get me kind of thing. So I'm just thinking about, you know, like a lot of us, we're just like, uh, I don't know, we can't stand still. You know, we just got to keep moving and stuff. So anyway, but that's a really, really good question because, I mean, I love emergency medicine. It's the best decision ever made, you know, second to becoming a doctor to begin with. So, but I always felt like emergency medicine had the greatest level of keen insight and the greatest opportunity to change stuff better than, more than anybody. And now I know we're like, we got all this overcrowding and stuff. I mean, we, our hallway spaces have letters and stuff. Now we got another hallway space that they call the surge, surge one, surge two, surge three. They're just spaces on the wall, you know, <laughs> with like gurneys. I mean, it's it's 60 people waiting in the waiting room and, and more, you know, and all the beds filled in the whole house. I mean, it's, it's crazy. It's just hard, you know, to be able to focus and think about stuff. So. But I still think we are we are the best able to do stuff. And I hope you guys like remember that because you can absolutely do it. There's no way, there's no reason why you can't. Don't believe the hype. Okay? <laughs> don't believe it. Don't don't second guess yourself. Yes, sir. How did you think the movement happens on change? Is a slow institutional process that happens over time to make it change something that is accepted and embraced as something that moves more rapidly? I think it's two things. The urgency of the moment, number one. And we've done everything and none of that stuff worked, right? We've done everything except the obvious, right? Going to the root cause. And the COO, you, when you, I mean, most people, you know, a lot of people used to be afraid of that guy. Because uh, seriously, you know, because you like you sit in front of him and he's going to like, he's going to interrogate everything that you're, you know, that you're doing and talking about. And what he's essentially doing is just pushing you, just like he did with that, uh, that uh, um, dashboard. He's like, oh, well, wow, everything's all green and stuff now. Well, you know, we must not be working hard enough, you know. But uh, um, I just think urgency of the moment and, you know, and and him somehow, you know, realizing that you know, we could do better, but, um, and not being afraid to look inside and see what, I mean, we have nothing to lose. I say to that hospital, what do you got? What do you have to lose? You know, just the opportunity to, to be transformative. 
I guess I guess the well is empty now. Thank you, Susan. So first, I want to thank Dr. Ilgen and Dr. Shaw and Dr. Huber for bringing Dr. James here today for a phenomenal presentation. Um, and most mm -hmm. importantly, I want to thank Dr. James for an absolutely inspiring presentation. Um, more important for the great work that you're doing. Certainly, you've given us a lot to think about, to strive towards. Uh, and for copious notes. And, uh, <laughs> thank you. Uh, we can't thank you enough. Just really inspiring your career, this presentation that you've had. So 